Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we are going to talk about the blood supply to the liver as well as we'll have a little clinical tidbit at the end on hepatic portal hypertension. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so first off, when we talk about the liver, we should actually have a good understanding of where we can find the liver anatomically. That's important. So if we actually take and look at me as an example, the liver, if we take a nine quadrant system, right? I come down a right vertical plane, left vertical plane, superior transverse plane, inferior transverse plane. It separates me into nine quadrants. The liver is going to occupy three out of those nine quadrants. It's going to occupy the right hypochondriac, the upper top one here, and then it's going to occupy a part of the epigastric. And there's actually a different lobes of the liver. The left lobe of the liver just barely peeks over into the left hypochondriac region. Okay? So remember, it's found in three different quadrants of the nine quadrant system. Right hypochondriac, epigastric, and a little bit of the left hypochondriac. Next thing you should understand is when we talk about its relationship, it's actually, most of it is surrounded by the rib cage. About from the seventh rib down to the eleventh rib is where the liver can actually extend to. Okay, there is a, a small portion of it that is exposed because you have what's called the coastal margin here and then you have your xiphoid process. That's important too because whenever someone's doing CPR, you make sure you always feel for that xiphoid process because if you start doing it there, you're going to break that thing off possibly and you could be stabbing the guy in the liver instead of helping him. Okay, so that's important that we should have a basic understanding of where we can find the liver. The next thing we should understand about it is how much does it weigh? Okay, about how much? In a male, the liver weighs approximately, okay, so if we say the mass of the liver or the weight of the liver, the mass of the liver for a male is approximately 1,600 grams, okay, about 1,600 grams. For a female, it's a little bit less, about 1,300 grams. And that can range. This is more of the adult life. We say that in general for uh, fetuses that are in the 10th week of gestation, their liver weighs approximately one-tenth of their actual body weight. Whereas <clears throat> if we take, for example, someone who is uh, uh, just born, their liver only weighs about um, an 18th of their normal body weight. In adults, it weighs about a 36th of their normal body weight. Okay, so that's important to know the mass of the liver. We know where we can find it. We know the mass of the liver. Next thing we should understand about the liver is its blood supply. It's extremely important that we do understand the blood supply of the liver. So when we talk about it, here's what I want you to remember. There's two blood supplies. Okay, so we're going to take blood supply here. And there's going to be two blood supplies. One is going to account for only 25% of the actual blood supply. 25% of blood supply. This 25% of the blood supply is going to be carried out by what's called the hepatic artery proper. And that's what I want to spend a little bit of time doing right now. And then we'll talk about the other one who accounts for 75% of the actual blood flow going into the liver. And that is going to be the um, portal vein. Okay. So let's go ahead and first start off here on the hepatic artery proper. Now, if you guys know a little bit about your um, cardiovascular system, like the anatomy wise, we have our aorta. We're going to assume that this guy is the aorta, right? We have the thoracic aorta and then we have the abdominal aorta. Coming off of the abdominal aorta, there is a big, big vessel here. It's called the celiac trunk. So again, if we were to kind of write here, this right here, we're going to assume is the abdominal aorta. Okay? Then coming off of the abdominal aorta, we have this big, big vessel here. And this is called the celiac trunk. Okay? So we have the abdominal aorta. Off the abdominal aorta comes the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk will actually split into three vessels. Okay? One of them is going to go to the stomach. We call this one right here that's coming off here, we call this one the left gastric artery, all right? So we're gonna have the left gastric artery. We'll have another one over here, and this one's actually gonna go to the spleen. So if I were to kind of encase this one right here, this one right there is going to be the splenic artery. All right, and then the next one, is, there's branches that come off of this, and there's actually gonna be another artery that goes and supplies the pancreas. There's a bunch of different branches that can go and supply the pancreas. We're just gonna call this one the pancreatic arteries. 
Okay, so we'll say these are our pancreatic arteries. Okay, now, these are just some of the branches, but the most important one that we should really understand is, is this guy right here. This guy right here is going to be what's called the common hepatic artery. So right here, we're gonna encase this one here. That is going to be the common hepatic artery. Now the common hepatic artery, when it enters into the liver, it'll actually enter into a structure, we'll see here in a second, the porta hepatis. But when it enters into the liver, it actually is going to, before it does that, it, it branches. Okay, so it gives off another branch. So what do I mean? Let's say, for example, here, I take the hepatic artery like this. Okay, so here I'm gonna have the common hepatic artery, and then what's gonna happen is it's gonna give off a branch here, and it's gonna give off a branch like this. Okay, so right here, this is the common hepatic artery. There's gonna be another branch, like we said, there's two branches here. One is gonna be this one. This is the one that we're gonna focus on. This is called the hepatic artery proper. The other one is gonna be called the gastroduodenal artery. The gastroduodenal artery, okay? So that's important. So I want you guys to know that the actual artery entering into the liver through the porta hepatis is really the hepatic artery proper. And then we'll talk about this in another video. For right now, I just wanna get the basic uh, blood, uh, blood supply down. But the hepatic artery proper will actually branch out and supply the right lobe of the liver and the left lobe of the liver. So for example, we're gonna say that this is the right side, this is the left side. So this would be the right hepatic artery. This would be the left hepatic artery. And then one last thing here since we're already there is the right hepatic artery will also give off another branch and this last branch here is actually gonna to go to another important organ here, and this is actually going to be called the cystic artery. Okay, so we have another branch here, and we'll say that that's the cystic artery, and that's gonna go and supply the gallbladder, okay? So again, just making sure that we got it down here, the arterial supply to the liver is gonna come via the celiac trunk to the common hepatic artery. The common hepatic artery will then branch off into two vessels, one is the gastroduodenal, the other is the hepatic artery proper. This is the one that's entering into the liver via the porta hepatis. Then when it's in the liver, it sprouts out and gives off branches. One branch is gonna to go to the left lobe of the liver via the left hepatic artery. The other branch is gonna to go to the right lobe of the liver via the right hepatic artery. And then just remember that there's a small branch here that comes off of the right hepatic artery called the cystic artery, okay? So that is gonna be the basic thing here that I want you guys to understand, at least for right now, for the blood supply. We'll get into more detail on the branches of these when we actually go into the liver lobule, the histology of the liver. Okay, but that's good for right now. <clears throat> Next thing, we have the, uh, the arterial supply. We understand this. One other thing that you should know is what kind of blood is this actual, uh, va this vascular system taking to the liver? This type of blood, is primarily going to be oxygen-rich blood. So it's gonna have a pretty high partial pressure of oxygen, around 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's really important is that this vessel is gonna be bringing oxygen-rich blood into the liver. It's different for the portal vein, and that's why I'm trying to emphasize this, okay? So now we have that. The next thing we should understand is the other 75% of the blood supply, which is the portal vein. Now, this right here, this big mamma jamma right there, that's our portal vein, okay? It's the one that's gonna be taking 75% of the blood into the actual liver. So here, if I write this right here, this big mamma jamma right here is called the portal vein, the hepatic portal vein. Now, one thing we should understand is where in the heck is this portal vein getting its blood? The portal vein is gonna be getting its blood from a bunch of different GI organs. Okay, pretty much all of your digestive viscera is going to be taking and emptying their blood supply into this portal vein to go to the liver. Anything that we're actually, for the most part, ingesting as it's going through the different parts and accessory glands, we'll see, takes and actually picks up that nutrient-rich blood 
as well as it might contain toxins and bacteria, as well as other different things too, alcohol, drugs, and we can take that thing into the liver for the liver to sift through it before it gets put into the systemic circulation. So what are some of those areas that it gets the blood from? Well, if we start up here at the top, we already know a lot of these, okay? The pancreas. The pancreas is gonna have some veins here that are gonna drain it. Remember that this was the pancreatic artery. It was delivering blood, oxygen-rich blood to the pancreas. Well, there's gonna be some blood that's gonna drain it here. And these are gonna be called, these ones right here, these are called your pancreatic veins. This is actually important. I, I wanna take a little bit, just a second here to mention why this is important. You should know this. When you're ingesting food, okay? Let's assume that it might be a carbohydrate rich meal. When we're taking carbohydrates and we're taking it into the liver, the liver is one of the most metabolic organs in the entire body. It controls so many things. Wouldn't it make sense that the pancreas, when we're in the fed state, it makes a hormone called insulin, right, for the pancreatic beta cells. And insulin will travel via the, port, the pancreatic veins into the portal vein into the liver. The reason why that's important is because if you remember, insulin is a super anabolic hormone. It actually is responsible for protein synthesis, lipogenesis, glycogenesis. It even controls glycolysis, amino acid uptake, glucose uptake, so many different things that this guy controls. So it's important when we're in the fed state and we're taking these nutrients to our liver that the pancreas be releasing a hormone called insulin to help to sh uh, shuttle some of that glucose into the liver cells so that not a lot of it is actually going into our systemic circulation. Makes sense, right? Okay. What other veins? Well, you're gonna have here another one, the splenic vein. Right here, there was the splenic artery. Now we're gonna have a vein here, taking the blood. And this is going to be called our splenic veins. This is important, we should understand this as well. What is the spleen most responsible for? We obviously know it's a lymphoid organ, a secondary at that. But you know that in the, the spleen, we have these different types of sinusoids. They call them the cords of Billrod, right? And it's responsible for removing any types of uh, old age or defective red blood cells. So any of the resulting red blood cells or any type of remnants of those destructed red blood cells are gonna get put into the splenic vein. So any bilirubin that we actually might have released via the breakdown of the actual hemoglobin in the red blood cell can get taken through the splenic veins into the portal vein and into the liver and can be incorporated into the bile. So that's important too, that we should understand that, okay? What else? What about these veins that are coming from the stomach? Okay, well these are called our gastric veins. So these are gonna be called our gastric veins. This is an important one too. There isn't much absorption in the stomach, but the things that can be absorbed into the stomach are a couple things. Those are usually lipid soluble substances, primarily, aspirin and alcohol, okay, are absorbed in the stomach. So it can be taking with it aspirin and alcohol and other lipid soluble substances through these gastric veins. Okay, for the last ones, here is the intestines, okay? I didn't want the diagram to, to be too crazy, so I just drew in a large, a, a big, big intestine here. But this intestine, so these are our intestines here, intestines, and this includes the large and the small, okay? Here's what I want you to understand. There's another, two other branches that come off of the abdominal aorta here. This one right here, which is gonna to go to parts of the intestine like the jejunum, the ileum. It's also gonna to go to the ascending colon, the cecum, the transverse colon. This guy is going to be called the superior mesenteric artery. So this is our superior mesenteric artery okay and again it's going to be supplying a lot of blood oxygen rich blood to different parts of the intestines like the jejunum the ileum the ascending colon the cecum the transverse colon a lot of structures the other one is going to supply the descending colon the sigmoid colon and the superior aspect of the rectum and this is going to be called the inferior mesenteric artery now, whenever they drop their blood off, they deliver oxygen-rich blood to the cells, the enterocytes here. Again, there's gonna be veins here. They're gonna be picking up a lot of that nutrient-rich blood from the small intestines or picking up water from the actual large intestines and taking it up via these two veins. Since this was the inferior mesenteric artery, we're gonna assume that this part here is the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, or the superior aspect of the rectum. And so this is gonna be drained by a big vein here 
And this vein is called the inferior mesenteric vein. This one here is going to be draining a lot of the jejunum, the ileum, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the cecum. So this one is going to be forming what's called the superior mesenteric vein. All right. So now we have all of these veins. They're going to be picking up nutrients, picking up water, electrolytes, picking up aspirin, alcohol, taking remnants of red blood cell production, taking insulin, maybe even some other hormones. You know, the, the spleen on the, in the pancreas also makes other hormones like glucagon, somatostatin, pancreatic polypeptide, a bunch of different things. But all of these things are going to be filtered in and taken up through the portal vein and into the liver. And again, what kind of things is it going to be taking with it? Okay, we don't need this diagram here anymore. Let's get this out of the way. What kind of substances is this portal vein going to be taking with it? It's important that we know this. It's going to be taking with it drugs, okay? Different types of drugs that could be carried out through the intestines or the stomach. It could also be taking hormones. For example, we said it could be taking insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, a bunch of different things. A large amount of nutrients. This is the important one. I want to make sure that we get this one across here. Lots of nutrient-rich blood, okay? Rich in glucose, rich in amino acid, rich in fatty acids, rich in trace minerals like copper, iron, so many different things. It also, unfortunately, could be taking certain pathogens. So sometimes um, in certain foods that we eat, there might actually be a bacteria, okay? There might be some viruses. There might even be some toxins. You know that there's uh, some toxins that come from bacteria, like lipopolysaccharides, which come from gram-negative bacteria. So a lot of different things can actually come uh, through this thing. And the last thing I want to mention here is the hepatic artery proper, right? And he was taking oxygen-rich blood to the liver. But all of these other arteries, superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric, the splenic, the pancreatic, and the gastric, they were delivering oxygen-rich blood to the cells of this GI tract. Well, they get drained by these different pancreatic veins, splenic veins, gastric veins, inferior mesenteric, superior mesenteric vein, and they're brought up, right, with all of the things that they're carrying with it, but not a lot of oxygen. So what's really important here is I want you guys to remember that this is going to be oxygen poor blood. That's important to remember. Okay, so I think we got for the most part, where ex what exactly is the blood supply to the liver? We got this down. One thing I want to add on just to hit it home here is when we're looking at the liver, right now this, this diagram here, we're looking at it particularly in the anterior surface. So like if you guys are looking at me, the way that you see the liver right now is the way that I'm actually standing here. You're getting an anterior and a little bit of a superior view of the liver. Okay, so this is the anterior surface of the liver. And again, just a little bit of gross anatomy, not a lot here, but obviously this is the right lobe of the liver. This is the left lobe of the liver. They're technically, you can say that it's separated by this nice little remnant here, um, this actually peritoneal ligament, if you will. And this right here is called the falciform ligament. It actually, it's one of the things that allows the liver to maintain what's called its intraperitoneal position. In other words, it, has, it's, it it's resides in the peritoneal cavity. Okay, so now I just, I want to orient you guys a little bit. So again, we have the right lobe, the left lobe, and the falciform ligament. But again, when we're looking at this, again, what view is this? We should write this down here. This is a anterior and a slightly superior um, view of the liver. Okay. So now, again, what's really important about this is I just want you guys to get an understanding here that when we have an anterior and superior view of the liver, there's, a, there's the surface of the liver, anterior and superior, that is covered by a very important organ, one of the main muscles of inspiration, it's called the diaphragm. So on the inferior surface of the diaphragm, it comes into contact with the superior and anterior surface of the liver. Now, that's called the diaphragmatic surface of the liver, the part of the liver that comes in contact with particularly the actual diaphragm. There is some ligaments. We'll see it better here when I go into the posterior inferior view, but we'll talk about some coronary ligaments and tri uh, triangular ligaments afterwards, okay? But I just want you guys to trust me for right now that we'll, we'll get to that. 
Okay, so next thing here. When we talk about the blood going into the liver, we're gonna go into more detail on this when we go into a liver lobule. Okay, for right now, I wanna get the basic thing here. If I were to draw a structural and functional unit of the liver, we, it comes down to this nice little hexagonal structure here, okay? This right here, this hexagonal structure is what we refer to as a liver lobule. And again, we'll focus on this more when we get to the liver lobule video. But what I want you to see here, just to put it together, is that when the portal vein enters into the liver, it also branches like the hepatic artery proper does. It gives off tributaries, okay? And those branches of the portal vein go to various parts of the liver. But if you look here, let's pretend that I just take some of them here, and I go right there, I go right here, I go right here, right here, and right here. All of these guys here, these little branches coming off here, those are your portal vein tributaries. They're hepatic portal venules. And they're going to go to each end or point of this hexagonal structure, this liver lobule. Okay? In the same way, if I take here, let's say here's my hepatic artery proper and it branches into right and left hepatic arteries, that's going to go and that's going to give off these branches. And it's going to give off these arterioles. And these arterioles are going to go and supply all the different portions of the liver lobule, all of these different six corners. You'll see one other thing, again, we'll talk about it when we get to liver lobule, but there's another structure called the bile duct that drains the bile from the hepatocytes via the bile canal liculi. And together, that whole structure makes what's called a portal triad, and we'll talk about that. But here's the big thing I want you to know. This, this is what, what usually blows my mind. Both of these guys, empty their blood into the same capillary network. Now that's what's super odd, because usually that's not the way it happens, but they do. They both empty their blood into a nice little capillary network here. And I'm gonna represent this capillary network like this for right now. Here's this little capillary network, like this and like this. That little space in there is called the sinusoidal capillaries, or liver sinusoids. The hepatic portal venule and the hepatic art arterioles will empty their blood into the sinusoids, and then from there, it'll empty into these things called central veins. Eventually, a bunch of the central veins will come together, and eventually what they'll do is, is they will empty their blood into what's called hepatic veins. So what is this vein up here called? This vein right here is called, so this is your hepatic veins. So after all of this sifting through all of the oxygens, the nutrients, the bacteria, the pathogens, the alcohol, the drugs, all that crap, it gets emptied into a central vein, emptied into the hepatic veins, it's completely been filtered, and then guess what the hepatic veins do? They take that blood and they put it right here into this nice little venous system. What is this venous system here called? This guy is your IVC, which stands for your inferior vena cava. And then from there, you guys should know that the inferior vena cava will take that blood and empty it into the right atrium. Okay? So that is the whole idea that I want you guys to get out of this portal circulation here, and as well as the arterial circulation. Now what I want to do is, just to hit it home, I want to take, so we looked at the anterior superior view of the liver. Now what I want to do is, I want to take a look at the posterior inferior view of the liver. Okay? Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to take a look at the posterior inferior view. So imagine here for a second. I take this liver, all right? I'm grabbing onto the right lobe. I'm going to flip it over. So now the right lobe is over here. The left lobe is over here. So I'm looking at the posterior and inferior view of the liver. So now what is this lobe right here? Okay, this right here. Actually, let's write down what view is this again. This is our posterior and inferior view of the liver. That's important because just like there was the anterior superior, that was the diaphragmatic surface, the posterior inferior view is more of the visceral surface of the liver. It's what comes into contact with a lot of the visceral organs. Okay? But again, this lobe right here is our right lobe. This over here, jeez, this over here is our left lobe of the liver. Now, we add two lobes to the mix. Why not make things more complicated, right? These two lobes right here are added to the mix now. This lobe 
I'm going to do them in a different color here. This lobe right here, which is bordered by this ligamentum teres, and then bordered by the, uh, specifically the gallbladder, this right here is called the quadrate lobe. And then there's another lobe right here, which is bordered by the fissure for the ligamentum uh, venosum, and then bordered over here by the inferior vena cava, and then bordered inferiorly by the porta hepatis. This right here is called the caudate lobe. Okay, so we have the left lobe, the right lobe of the liver, the caudate lobe, and the quadrate lobe. Now, a couple other things. Again, I wanted to mention, I already kind of put it right there. But if you see here, okay, the falciform ligament was going anteriorly right here. It reflects backwards, okay? So it reflects backwards, and when it reflects backwards, it makes these... It makes this triangular ligament over here. So you see this ligament right here? This kind of like where it comes to a point. This part right there is called the left triangular ligament. It's what helps to anchor the uh, left lobe of the liver to the inferior surface of the diaphragm. Then there's this little part right here. You see this little thing here where it reflects back and then comes together and it makes a little fissure there. That little fissure is actually going to be the remnant of the ductus venosus. But instead, now that it we're in the adult, it is called the ligamentum venosum. Okay, but there's a little fissure in there. And then one more is you have this little uh, ligament right here. You see this guy right there? Let's do this one here in this uh, blue color. This guy comes over here and comes down from the porta pattis. This is a really interesting one, especially with respect to fetal circulation. This one right here is actually called the ligamentum teres, or the round ligament. You know why this is important? Because in fetal circulation, in the fetus, this was actually the umbilical vein. And then in the fetus, the ligamentum venosus was the ductus venosus. So the umbilical vein was taking blood from the placenta and taking it to the baby. But it had to get that blood into the systemic circulation, into the, the baby's inferior vena cava. How did it do that? There was this little blood vessel here, this little channel or shunt. And it's now, it's the ligamentum venosum in the adults, but it's the ductus venosus in the fetus. And so the ligamentum teres, right, which used to be the umbilical vein, delivered blood right through that ductus venosus and then into the inferior vena cava. Isn't that so cool? All right. Now, what happens is there's a little reflection, again, of this, the, uh, the, the visceral peritoneum back here. And it forms these two ligaments right here. This one up here and this one down here. Okay, this one right here, up at the top, is called the anterior coronary ligament. This one right here is called the posterior coronary ligament, okay? Now again, these are helping to anchor the liver to the diaphragm. And then there's one little point here. You see where they, the anterior and the posterior coronary ligament come together and they make a nice little point here? That part right there is called the right triangular ligament, right? Triangular ligament. Okay, cool. And again, all of these are helping to anchor the diaphragm, anchor the liver to the diaphragm. There's a nice little space in there. They call that the bare area. It's where there's no actual covering of visceral peritoneum. That's called a bare area there. And again, this is the inferior vena cava. So this is your IVC right here. Then you see how you have this big old structure right there. Really, really important guy here. Really, really muscular thing right there. This guy right here is called your gallbladder. And it sits in what's called the um, cystic notch or the fossa. There's actually a little fossa there where it sits called the cystic fossa. Now, here's where I want us to really, really zoom in now. So now that we got a good orientation, the basic anatomy here of the liver, we now have one more area. See this big, big area right here where you see a vein, you see an arterial, and you see this little biliary system coming out and in. This whole thing right here, I'm going to highlight this 
in orange here, like this, I'm going to kind of encase it. That right there is a special structure called the porta hepatis. The porta hepatis is where the hepatic arterial, so again, this is the, this is going to be the hepatic artery. So let's put here HA. So this is going to be hepatic artery. This right here is going to be the portal vein. So let's put portal vein. And then you have this nice little system here coming out. We'll talk about this later, but you guys have already known from a lot of the videos, we have what's called the left hepatic duct, which is actually going to be taking bile from the left lobe of the liver. The right hepatic duct, which is going to be taking bile from the right lobe of the liver. They come together and they make this structure here, which is coming out, called the common hepatic duct. So I'm going to put here CHD for common hepatic duct. Okay, so that's important. So now here's what I want you guys to understand then. The porta hepatis has three important structures that are going in and out, and that is going in, portal vein, hepatic artery proper. Coming out is the common hepatic duct. There is two other things that are actually going in and out of here. You have what's called a nerve plexus that's actually going in there, the hepatic plexus, that's actually formed from uh, specifically the vagus nerve and coming from the ciliac ganglion, the sympathetic nerves coming from the ciliac ganglion. They're also going in there. And you have some lymphatic systems that are actually kind of draining the liver as well. Okay, so that gives us a good orientation now exactly about how the actual portal vein, hepatic arterial, and even the common hepatic duct are going into and out of the liver. Now, here's where I want to put in this nice little clinical tidbit. It's really important that we do have this clinical tidbit in there. Understanding the anatomy and the physiology is crucial, but if we make a nice little clinical correlation here, watch this. What happens if for some reason that a person isn't able to get enough blood going through the liver and into the hepatic vein. There's three primary causes. Prehepatic causes, intrahepatic causes, post-hepatic causes. We're not gonna go into super detail. This isn't a patho video. It's just making a clinical correlation here. For whatever reason, there's a thrombosis of any of these veins that are emptying into the portal vein. That could cause the blood flow to back up right? And if the blood flow is backing up, there's going to be pressure on this side of the portal vein. So if there's something here that's actually occluding the blood flow, the pressure is going to back up from this point. That can lead to portal hypertension. Pretty dangerous stuff here. Another common cause is, out of all of them, the most common is anything that can cause the fibrosis of the liver. So, for example, we call that cirrhosis. The fibrotic liver cirrhosis could be caused by overuse of alcohol. It could be due to drug toxicity. It could be due to chronic hepatitis. It could even be due to fatty liver disease or Wilson's disease or hemochromatosis. So many causes. The whole point that I want to get across is, for whatever reason, there's fibrosis of the liver. It narrows the vessels that are these hepatic, art, uh, hepatic venules. They get narrowed. And if they're narrowed, the pressure proximal to that narrowing is going to get back. It's going to start building up and building up and building up. And this portal venous pressure is going to start really, really rising. The last cause is, and again, not very common as well, but again, it, I'm just mentioning it, is a post-hepatic cause. Anything that is affecting the blood flow draining the liver. So, for example, maybe there's a thrombus of the hepatic veins. They call that Bud Chiari syndrome. If there's some type of occlusion of the hepatic veins, the blood can backflow into the liver. And if there's backflow into the liver, it causes this portal venous system to develop a lot of pressure. Now, why is this bad when there is portal venous hypertension? Three reasons why. And I'm going to go through each one of them. I want to go through the first one here. One of the, uh, and it's something that can happen with the pathophysiology of portal tension is there can be um, anorectal hemorrhoids. Okay? Now, here's what I want us to understand. There are certain areas where the portal venous system and the systemic system form what's called an anastomosis. 
Okay? So this right here, I'm going to kind of encase it here in orange. This is called a porto systemic anastomosis. Anastomosis. Now, generally, I have a little pressure system right here. Okay, a little pressure valve. Normally, the portal system and the systemic system, there's not much blood flowing through these anastomoses. So the pressure is really low and it's pretty equal on both sides. But in a situation like hepatic portal hypertension, so hepatic portal hypertension, this is going to affect it. And what it's going to do is it's going to take this little pressure valve and boop, it's going to go over here and now it's going to shift to the left. So now the pressure, the pressure is going to be over here now. And so there's going to be more portal pressure, portal venous pressure, than systemic venous pressure. Now, if you guys know anything about um, the concept of pressure flow, things like to go from areas of high pressure to low pressure, where there's the least resistance. Well, because there's some type of venous thrombosis or cirrhosis or Bud Chiari syndrome, and remember, prehepatic, intrahepatic, posthepatic causes, these things will cause the blood to backflow through these portal venous systems. Now, these veins here, they're not used to large volumes of, of blood. But whenever you cause a lot of this blood from the portal system to come out here, it starts causing them to dilate and form a lot of like varicosities here. And this varicosity is going to be causing hemorrhoids, anal tentacles coming out the butt, right? So you don't want that. These can be pretty nasty, okay? So that's important to remember is that if there is a high pressure system here, the portal system's higher, it's going to go to the path of least resistance, which is going to go into these rectal veins. That's important because if you remember, for example, we talked about it briefly over here. What was this vein called that was the part of the portal vein? This was called the superior rectal vein. That supplied the superior aspect of the rectum. Well, there's middle and inferior rectal veins. That's for the systemic veins. That's where the circuit is. Okay, this one isn't a medical emergency, not so serious. Obviously, you can do ligation of these, or they can actually surgically remove them as well. Pretty nasty stuff, though, okay? All right, so now we talked about anal rectal hemorrhoids. Now I want to take another view here, and I want to talk about another uh, clinical manifestation that we can see with someone who has hepatic portal hypertension. So we're going to take a, a sagittal view here. This is, so, for example, I'm coming here. I'm making this type of section, a sagittal section. I'm turning my body so that you guys can see it. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of anatom uh, anatomical orientation here. Okay, so again, this is actually a sagittal view here. Okay, this is a sagittal view. So right here, this is our anterior abdominal wall. This is our liver. Now, when we look at the liver in this way, this is the superior surface of the liver. All right here, I'll put superior. This is actually the posterior surface of the liver. This is the anterior surface of the liver. And then down here is the inferior surface of the liver. What's important for you guys to understand here is, remember when, when there actually is the fetal life, right? There has to be this um, the umbilical cord, which allows for the umbilical vein to take blood from the placenta to the baby, where, again, we talked about it, will empty it to the ductus venosus, which will take it and shunt it into the inferior vena cava. When, when we're born, that, that actual vein closes, okay? And it becomes this ligament that we talked about, and this ligament is called the ligamentum teres, or the round ligament. Because teres means round. So it's also the round ligament. Now, remember I told you that if for whatever reason, let's say here's our portal vein. So here's our portal vein. Okay, it's taking blood into the liver, and again, it's branching out here to the different parts of the liver, right, left, lobe, all that stuff. But for whatever reason, due to the portal hypertension, prehepatic thrombosis, or intrahepatic being any type of cirrhosis, posthepatic being occlusion, Bud Chiari syndrome, whatever it might be, for the portal hypertension, the blood has to go somewhere. It needs to go somewhere. It has to have somewhere to go. So what happens is, 
is this high pressure from the portal hypertension recanalizes this ligament because it really it has a little a little lumen here but it's so so small but what happens is because of this high pressure system because of the portal hypertension it recanalizes that isn't that crazy so there's what's called recanalization of ligamentum teres and it provides a little blood circuit for it to roll through. Now, this isn't, again, it's not a super dangerous condition, but it can actually be helpful um, in your differential diagnosis, like a diagnostic sign, right? Because what happens is the blood has to go somewhere. So what happens is the blood goes into this actual ligamentum teres, which gets recanalized, and then it actually moves into these superficial peri-umbilical veins. So you have some superficial, superficial peri-umbilical veins. Now remember, going back to this again, here's our little pressure valve. Normally it's equal. Not much blood going through this portosystemic anastomosis. But because of the portal hypertension, the portal venous pressure rises. If the portal venous pressure rises, the blood has to go from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. When it does, it goes into these peri-umbilical veins, these superficial peri-umbilical veins. And guess what that does? It causes these guys to start kind of bulging and forming these nasty little uh, varicose veins type of structure on the abdomen. And you can see it. They call this caput medusa. Okay, so they call this, when these veins here are super distended, they call it caput Medusa, okay? They get that because uh, the Greek god, Medusa, looked like she had a bunch of snakes on her head. So they thought that these veins, when they were distended because of the portal hypertension, it looked like that. So that's why they call it cap Medusa. Again, not a medical emergency, but again, it's important for diagnosis. The last one that is a medical emergency, and if it does happen, it's usually not a good sign, okay, is esophageal varices. Okay, so let's do this last one here in purple esophageal, the last one is called esophageal varices. Now, again, what is this little area right here? This is a portal systemic anastomosis. Remember, this is the portal vein here, right? Well, one of the branches that goes to the esophagus, you know the esophagus, the inferior portion of the esophagus, inferior portion, is drained by the portal vein but the superior and middle aspect of the esophagus is drained by the systemic veins. When they come together again, they form this little portosystemic anastomosis, but because of prehepatic causes like thrombosis, intrahepatic like fibrosis of the liver, or posthepatic causes like Bud-Chiari syndrome, the pressure starts building up. As the pressure starts building up, the pressure starts backflowing, and again, go back to our pressure valve here. If the pressure starts rising in the portal venous system, where is it gonna wanna go? it's gonna to wanna to go to the path of least resistance. So guess where it'll do? It'll shunt through the portal systemic anastomosis into the systemic veins in the esophagus. And there's internal veins and external veins. Here's what can happen though, look at this. As these get filled with blood, their walls get distended. As the walls are being distended, eventually, Due to the consistent chronic portal hypertension, these puppies can rupture and you can start spitting up blood. Okay, so you could have hemoptesis, but another common sign is, guess what? You just swallow it. And some of that blood will get passed out, right? Through the poo poo, right? Into the poo poo. And what you'll see is, you'll see the stool is gonna be kind of black and tarry stool. And that could be a sign that maybe there is some type of GI bleed, most likely upper GI, and it's these esophageal varices. And again, really important that these get uh, paid attention to because this can be a medical emergency. Okay, this can be a medical emergency. Usually the, the treatment of choice for this one is an endoscopic ligation. Okay, if that not, then they can do pharma, you know, they can get pharmacological uh, interventions like octreotide and other different types of drugs. The new modern procedure that they're using nowadays, though,
to really help out with alleviating this portal hypertension is called TIPS. Okay, so what is it called? It's called TIPS. And TIPS stands for Trans Jugular Intra Hepatic Porto Systemic Shunt. Okay, T I P S. Okay, and again, they call this TIPS. You're probably like, no wonder they call it TIPS, right? Now, what they do is they take a, um, a catheter and they thread it through the internal jugular vein, they thread it through the right brachiocephalic vein, through the superior vena cava, through the inferior vena cava, and then what they do is they give off a branch into these hepatic veins, right? So these are your hepatic veins. From here, it'll go to a portal vein tributary, and it'll put in a stent. And by putting in this stent, it's trying to increase the blood flow and alleviate a lot of this portal hypertension. So by doing this, putting in this stent here, we're going to kind of open this vessel up a little bit more. And by doing that, it's gonna to help to try to alleviate a lot of this back pressure so that instead of the blood going to these different areas, which they are, it can start moving through the portal circulation. So pretty cool uh, modern technique that they're using nowadays. There is another one that they could use Again, they don't use it as much, but they could do it, is you could put a little shunt right here between the portal vein and the inferior vena cava, because this is your inferior vena cava. Again, this is your portal vein. And so they can do what's called a portal cable shunt. That's another one. And again, by doing that, it allows for the blood to be diverted into the inferior vena cava and back up to the right atrium. Okay, so that's an important point to understand. All right, engineers, so in this video, we talked about the blood supply to the liver, and we had a little clinical tidbit on the hepatic portal hypertension. Guys, I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you guys did like this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, guys, if you guys get a chance, please go check out our Facebook, our Instagram, and even our Patreon account. If you guys can even donate a dollar, we would appreciate it very, very much so. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.